through South Kingstown recently. And um, we've been doing uh, also the um, over, overpass um, uh, protest with the, with the big lettering. Uh, we're doing LED during the winter months, dark months, and we're doing uh, daytime lettering, large lettering and other signs too about Chase Bank and Line 3 and Bank of America, et cetera. So we've done those on a regular basis too. Um, last night I was um, part of the, uh, well, I was watching the, the uh, presentation about the uh, Deadline Glasgow campaign, which Alec Conan, who's our speaker tonight, is one of the organizers of. He's a coordinator, a national coordinator for Stop the Money Pipeline and also coordinates the um, Chase Bank campaign and uh, um, obviously has a long history with and, and with Seattle, um, um, 350 Seattle, where they uh, historically just had amazing protests back there, uh, numerous shutting down numerous bank branches and civil disobedience, et cetera. Um, so having said that, I'll, uh, I'll hand it over to Alec. Um, he's just gonna tell us uh, what's going on with the Glasgow campaign and possibly also uh, anything updates necessary with uh, line three or um, Chase Bank or anything else he wants to cover. Oh, thank you so much, Brian. And it's very nice to meet and to see everyone in this on this call and to take advantage of the miracle of Zoom to fly in carbon free almost to Rhode Island for the evening and be with you all at your general meeting. Um, my name is Alec and I was born and raised in Scotland, um, but have been living in Seattle on Duwamish and Coast Salish land for uh, about seven years now. And um, yeah, really happy to be here with all of you. And I just want to start off by expressing uh, really deep gratitude to all of you for all of your work in the climate movement and all of your work to forward climate action and climate justice in Rhode Island. I think the, the one thing that gives me hope is knowing that there's groups all over the country like this one and in every state and almost every city um, doing the same work. And uh, yeah, that's why I was grateful for the opportunity to, to come along and, and share a little bit. Um, as Brian said, I'm the coalition coordinator for Stop the Money Pipeline. Stop the Money Pipeline is a coalition of nearly 170 organizations, including Climate Action Rhode Island, um, who are uh, dedicated to stopping the funding that's going to the corporations driving the climate crisis, particularly stopping the funding um, of the fossil fuel industry and also stopping the funding of, of corporations uh, driving deforestation. Um, I figure I, tonight I'd like to share a little bit about my own background and uh, how I got into activism and uh, my organizing with 350 Seattle and then maybe tell a little bit of a story about the history of the, the Chase campaign which, which Brian and Abby and uh, others on this call have, have been an integral part of um, but we'd love to share a little bit about the history of that specific campaign because we're in an I think we're in our fifth year of the campaign. Um, uh, so there's some pretty rich history there. And because 45 minutes is a long time to talk, I'll even show, show some videos um, of some of the actions that Brian uh, was referencing. We've, we've had a few pretty powerful actions, pretty fun actions in Seattle over the years. Uh, so I'll share some of those videos. But um, yeah, I wanna just start off a little bit about my background. I became very alarmed about the climate crisis about a decade ago and had no idea what to, to do about it. And uh, I, I wrote a novel called The Activist, um, kind of before I did any activism, because um, I was a writer first and an organizer second. And um, that novel was published back in 2015, uh, right about the time that I arrived in Seattle and I showed up in Seattle having written a book called The Activist uh, about our myriad environmental crises but having never really done any activism and um, but I showed up in Seattle really knowing that I wanted to jump 
both feet in to the climate movement when I arrived. So I arrived and one of the very first things I did was show up to a 350 Seattle general meeting, a little bit like this, except it wasn't on Zoom and there was a potluck that we all shared, which I'm sure was your standard before, before the pandemic wow. came in. And um, yeah, I actually was here. I was on a visa that temporarily meant that I wasn't allowed to leave the country, but I also wasn't allowed to work. Um, so I had time on my hands and um, I learned about the uh, uh, Gates Foundation's very significant investments in the fossil fuel industry. They had about a billion dollars invested in the fossil fuel industry, despite being a powerful philanthropy that was doing a lot of good in the world uh, as it relates to global health and combating poverty. They had these investments that were really not aligned with the values that they um, were forwarding in the world. So I uh, was involved in a campaign for about nine months, ran a campaign for about nine months, uh, pushing the Gates Foundation to commit to fossil fuel divestment. And I really had like no idea what I was doing whatsoever, but we fired outside of the Gates Foundation's visitor center for every day they were open for three months. I took to telling people that I was working at the Gates Foundation, which was kind of true. Um, and we took kayaks to the, the shores of Bill Gates' mansion with giant banners that said Gates Divest. And I was kayaking with a, it pulling along an empty kayak with a sign that said reserved for Bill because <laughs> um, we wanted him to come out and kayak with us. And long story short, while we never got a... A uh, formal response from the Gates Foundation, they sold off 85% of their fossil fuel stocks um, within a year of us launching that campaign um, after some pretty significant media attention on them. They sold all of their Exxon stock and they sold all of their BP stock, uh, reducing their fossil fuel investments by about 85%. And left me very convinced of the, the power of strategic campaigns to move even very powerful institutions. And from there... I um, kind of was just all in with, with climate activism and with the climate movement. And then my first big experience with civil disobedience as a important strategy and tactic for change was with Break Free. If any of you were around for Break Free from fossil fuels back in 2016, it was a, a globally coordinated day of action to um, disrupt the fossil fuel industry at the, at the source. And so here in Washington state, about 2000 people traveled to uh, the state's largest oil refinery. And there was about 1500 people marched up to the gates of the refinery. And there were about 500 people who engaged in an oil train blockade and were on the train tracks for about three and a half days, meaning that oil trains couldn't get to the refinery. And in the end, uh, the police came in and cleared the camp and 52 people were arrested. And it was such a, a powerful experience for me personally and in my own development as, a, as an organizer and an activist um, and really feeling people coming together uh, like that to, to take risk and to do something that felt commens closer to being commensurate with the severity and urgency of the crisis um la left a, a pretty lasting impact uh, on me and then right about kind of the time that standing rock was becoming a, a massive focal point of both the climate movement and uh the movement for indigenous sovereignty and indigenous rights was the first time that i jumped into any campaigning focused on wall street focused on on financial institutions uh if some folks may uh, remember back in 2016 when there were 10,000 people out in North Dakota at Standing Rock there was a pretty clear call came out from organizers at Standing Rock to, to defund Apple and to start targeting the funders of the Dakota Access Pipeline and using a distributed organizing model we we jumped in to that campaign and we were able to organize about 30 or maybe 35 demonstrations outside of Wells Fargo's bank branches in the month of December. Uh, we had a mass meeting. We formed lots of teams. Each team had a, an affinity group lead or an action group lead, and they all planned their own actions. Some groups 
plan two or three actions, other groups planned four or five. And in all, in all, we had about eight or nine groups that organized about 30 to 40 actions in the month of December. And from there, the attention very much, and we also had about, and another action, we had about 50 Wells Fargo customers, myself included, um, who lined up outside of the Wells Fargo Center in downtown Seattle and, and closed their accounts one after another. And there was a mass rally with about 500 people there and this very powerful situation where they couldn't turn away their customers. So they, we were just one long line of customers and they led us in one after another, after another to, to close our bank accounts. And, um, and then from there, uh, Matt Remley, who's a, a punk papa Lakota, who's from Standing Rock and, and lives in Seattle, had the, the great idea to, uh, to ask that the city of Seattle stops banking with Wells Fargo. The city of Seattle was banking with Wells Fargo at the time, and uh, we, we put, turned our attention to them. And uh, this was recently after Trump was elected, and there was just so much movement energy on the streets. And, and long story short, we managed to get the city council to pass an ordinance committing to more socially responsible banking and committing to breaking ties with Wells Fargo. And there was so much energy around that campaign that at a finance committee meeting on a Wednesday morning, there was a thousand people showed up. And like, you know, I'm pretty sure that we broke the world record for people who have attended a finance committee meeting. They're not usually particularly well attended. Um, but there were so many people that only about 150 could get into the room and there were close to a thousand and outside outside a city hall and that ordinance that ordinance passed um in march of 2017 and we were kind of looking at what to do next and very unfortunately this was around about when trump came into power and trump passed uh, one of his first executive orders was to say that the keystone xl pipeline would be built so we were wondering what we could possibly do to help stop the Keystone XL pipeline, given Trump's determination that it would be built. And we thought um, the banks are going to fund this pipeline. And right now we expect that TC Energy, the company behind it, are going to be looking for financing for this project. So we, uh, we hosted a press conference outside of a main Chase branch in downtown Seattle and we had a city council member speak and uh, a couple of indigenous leaders from the local community. And we issued a pretty clear statement that if JP Morgan Chase um, did not make a public statement saying that they would not fund the Keystone XL pipeline, and we were going to engage in civil disobedience and shut down many of their branches on May 7th, um, 2017. Probably won't surprise anyone too much that two weeks passed and JP Morgan Chase did not make a public statement. So we did move forward and we uh, we did organize uh, an action that I actually want to show you a very short one minute video of that I'm just about to pull up here. Make sure I have my sound on and I'm going to do a little screen share and show you this one minute video. This was our first ever action on JP Morgan Chase that that launched 350 Seattle's participation in the in the Chase campaign. And I'll do a little screen share here. To get involved, and we have to disrupt the system. The Keystone Pipeline is a toxic asset, and they will not be investing in that. down memory lane for me here i haven't uh, i haven't told this story in a little while um yeah there were there were 
13 affinity groups that simultaneously shut down 13 branches of, of JP Morgan. And that helped us put Chase's funding of the fossil fuel industry on the front page of the Seattle Times and on Democracy Now! and The Young Turks and a variety of national media, as well as a variety of other local media, including pretty much every local TV news outlet. And it was one of the first times, I think, where people really started talking more seriously about the financial institutions and their role in the, the climate crisis. And uh, as that video said, this is just the beginning and uh, it really was just the beginning. I think at the time we were kind of bluffing a little bit. It's not like we had some grand plan. We did not have a five-year strategic campaign to that would chart the step-by-step -step path that we were going to follow to get Chase to align its business model with the Paris Agreement. We were kind of just, you know, activists who wanted to do something and uh, believed in, in our ability to, to help make something happen. But it's, we've come a long way since that. That was back in May 2017. And just a few months after that, Rainforest Action Network, a pretty well-established and powerful corporate campaigning organization that's been running hard-hitting corporate campaigns for about 30 years, uh, launched the Chase campaign with a big action in Denver. And, and pretty quickly, uh, myself as a 350 Seattle organizer and, and staff at RAN started to, to collaborate. And in October of that year, led by Mazaska Talks, which is an indigenous-led organization um, led by a couple of uh, native folks that live here in the Pacific Northwest, and also at the time, uh, a woman called Jackie Fielder, who is based in the Bay Area, um, and who just recently came on as Stop the Money Pipelines Communications Coordinator, but um, working closely with Mazaska Talks, um, we launched Divest the Globe, or I should say Mazaskat Talks launched Divest the Globe, and I had the honor of supporting them in that. And it was the first time anyone, as far as I am aware, had called for a global day of action targeting the financiers of the climate crisis, the financiers of the fossil fuel industry. And people really responded. There were actions in 12 countries, four continents, and, and 60 cities. In Seattle, we had one of our uh, best, I think, bank actions. And we built 16 different action groups. Each action group had a between 10 and 20 people in it. And each of those action groups went to seven or eight or nine or 10 bank branches to stage a 15 to 20 minute disruption. And we actually disrupted business at 106 bank branches in a single day. Um, and that was October 23rd, 2017. And I actually want to show another little video um, of that, that action, that Divest the Globe action. This one's a little bit longer. I'm going to do another screen share. And hopefully these videos are a nice way to break up uh, my, my voice. But this was the wrap up video from Divest the Globe in October 2017. problems all over the world. They're privatizing water. They're causing deforestation. There's pollution. And so today, we are divesting the globe. had actions in Paris, in Massachusetts, in Tampa, Toronto, Montreal. He said that if we left the letter there, that they would call the police. They reacted as if we were leaving a time bomb. The uh, Chase Bank here is closed. I think they're closed for the day. The banks had a stronger filter around human rights, free prior and informed consent. What happened with the Dakota Access Pipeline with Standing Rock should have never happened. This is my home we're talking about. You know, <laughs> these, these, this land, this, these rivers. I mean, I'm 14 years old. I can't do a lot that other people can. And what you can do is take your money out of the banks and 
going to start mobilizing their payment. Pipelines are a big issue in our communities. We will no longer let these things happen. We'll no longer let them take advantage of our people. Divestment being the tool that we're using, it's, it's what we're using to tell these oil companies that we will no longer stand for the desecration of Mother Earth. We will no longer continue to invest in these projects. If there's enough financial risk posed to the banks, um, as a result of these investments, then these investments will no longer be worth it for the bank. Everybody is making an effort to go to their communities, their cities, their banks, and telling them, why are you allowing injustice to happen? And we're calling them out. This has to stop. Um, they can have a role in being accountable and making investments in renewables. They can stop paying rent and the bank should not be investing in these kind of injustices. We need to contemplate deeply. Our people, our first peoples, know that path a road to wellness, harmony, and peace with every living thing. At the end of the day, the only thing that matters is life. The only thing that matters is the future. We can all choose where we put our money. Actually, kind of, I forgot I was in that video. It's been a long time since I watched it, and I was, oh, I'm there I am. I really don't like hearing the sound of my own voice, which is ironic because I kind of like to talk, but I don't like hearing the sound of my own voice. Um, so we don't have to, to dive into that. But um, yeah, that was October 2017. And really, like, we started to see more momentum around bank campaigning and holding the banks accountable um, than we'd ever seen before. Later that year in December, myself and Rachel Heaton, one of the women that you heard in that video from Mazaska Talks, and, and Matt Remley, also from Mazaska Talks, we had a, a meeting with the regional chairwoman of JP Morgan Chase in the Pacific Northwest, as well as the global head of sustainability and their head of government affairs um, in the Pacific Northwest. And that was the first time that we'd had a meeting with kind of Chase higher ups, with Chase management. And, um, you know, they, they, they said sympathetic things, but didn't, weren't able to make any promises of anything uh, to change. And right about that time, um, well, actually, the one thing I will share from that meeting is uh, the regional chairwoman, Phyllis Campbell, at, towards the end of the meeting said, you know, and now that we've met, could you please stop disrupting our bank branches? Our branch managers really don't like it. Um, to which we replied, sure, as soon as you stop funding fossil fuels, we can stop doing that. So please stop funding fossil fuels so we don't have to get our message across um, in this fashion. Um, and it was right about this time that the national coalition started to form and um, we started having monthly meetings with activists from all across the country kind of co-conspiring on actions. And that included a lot of 350 affiliated local groups, in, including Climate Action Rhode Island and, and big shout out to Brian and Abby who have been showing up in that space and, and leading in that space for years. Um, but other groups like 350 Madison and 350 PDX and uh, 350 Colorado and uh, a number of other 350 uh, local groups show up in that space, as, as well as other unaffiliated climate action groups and some uh, rising tide groups and some XR groups. And it was the first time we really started kind of co-conspiring as a, as a national coalition. And that led in uh, May 2018 to our first ever uh, national day of action solely focused on Chase. We had a global day of action that was focused on any funder of the climate crisis. And then in May 2018, we narrowed in our focus on, on the biggest and the worst, the biggest and the baddest, JP Morgan Chase. I think now is loaned, if I remember rightly, $317 billion, well over a quarter of a trillion to the fossil fuel industry just since the Paris Agreement was signed six years ago. Um, and this action in May 2018, we had actions in 19 cities. I forget 
Brian and Abby, if there was one in Rhode Island, I, I would guess that there may very well have been. Um, and I want to show two shortish videos from these actions, and these will be the last uh, two videos that I, I show. Um, but one thing that we did that was a little bit different with this action is that we actually really advertised the fact that we were coming. Um, we, I'll show the video and it shows you how we advertised that we were coming. So this was a, this is what we did about a week before the action. And this is on a, a highway in downtown Seattle, one of the the second busiest highway in the, the city of Seattle. So that was a that was a week before the action. Were folks able to hear the sound on that one? No, but could you hear the sound on the other two? Ha, huh, weird. I was able to hear the sound fine. I'm not sure what happened there. Um well, there was no voice. All you all you heard was some cool music. So I'm sorry you missed out on the, the cool music there. Um it was kind of funky and had a nice beat um, and it made the video seem even cooler. Um, but that was, I'll not play it again, just in the interest of time. Uh, that was a week before the action and we actually got King 5, the one of the most prominent local news stations who aired a segment and they were like, activists say they're going to shut down Chase next week on May 7th, which you know, obviously meant Chase knew that we were coming. And so we were playing this uh, cat and mouse game of still trying to successfully um, execute a successful action, even though we had advertised pretty loudly that we were coming. And then we were able to do this. I am going to double check that the sound works here because I do think sounds important for this video. Um, Are you, were you able to hear that? Yeah, okay, well, I'll do the screen share and then hopefully the, the sound works okay. They've increased their funding and fossil fuels and so we're here to let them know that um, we will no longer be silent. to stop contributing to, to the devastation of Mother Earth, but also the violation of indigenous rights. The fact that we've got Second Ave shut down and the car fees up, and all of these people that are out here paying attention and realizing what these banks are contributing to, I think we have you know, definitely spread a message today. Um, but ultimately, we would want Chase Bank to quit uh, funding, you know, climate disaster. They're representing the missing and murdered indigenous women, and they put down these massive, huge man camps. I mean, they're following the, the, the money. But with it comes um, human trafficking, and, um, and then the indigenous in the area come up missing or murdered. These are real people with real lives we're fighting for. And there's a lot of young people living in fear. I, I live in fear. And the one thing that gives me hope is when I see I'm surrounded by 
people that are supporting and fighting for our rights. That gives me hope. And so I'd, I'd ask anybody out there who's watching, and anybody who, who feels anything about this to come and support and come and talk to their banks and ask where their money is going. Ask what they're investing in. What, ask the banks where they're putting their money. And if it, it is in the tar sand, if it is in the violence against indigenous women, if it is in the destruction of our mother earth, then I'd ask them to take their money out and withdraw it from that bank. So even though we told them we were coming, we still managed to get them. That was Second Avenue, which is in downtown Seattle, right outside of the Pacific Northwest headquarters. Um, it's the primary headquarters for Chase in the states of Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Montana. And that was directly outside of their, their headquarters. And uh, 17 people were arrested that day. Um, taking our total number of people arrested protesting Chase branches up to about 50 in the course of 12 months. And we kept on doing actions like that. In December of that year, we took a uh, mock 50 foot inflatable pipeline to their headquarters and deployed it in their headquarters. Um, there's a video of that, which I'll, I'll share in the chat box in case anyone wants to, to watch later. Um, and uh, we had a fake oil spill in there and, and again got it very um, noticed and one thing you know I've really learned in this is just the importance of centering specific fights you know it, whether it's line three or the Keystone XL pipeline or the Trans Mountain pipeline making it about a very specific project and of course they need to stop funding all fossil fuels but when a project that is happening in the here and now and is causing harm to communities here and now and is being opposed by the in the here and now, we got it makes so much sense to tie our campaigning and our demands to that specific project to help stop the immediate harm that's happening. But also when we say defund line three, we're also at the same time, we're clearly saying defund all fossil fuels. And that's a, it's a way of us saying that. Um, so I want to talk now a little bit about Stop the Money Pipeline. So this took us up to about 2019 and Stop the Money Pipeline first started to come together uh, in November of 2019. And Bill McKibben, who I'm sure everyone on this call is familiar with, is this is a 350 affiliated group. Um, but Bill, the, one of the founders of 350, um, wrote a piece in the New Yorker called The Money is the Oxygen in Which the Fires of Global Warming Burn. And if I, if you haven't read it, it's a, it's a long form piece and I, I really encourage you to read it. It's um, still one of the best pieces that I've read that gives a, a holistic and high level overview of finance campaigning within the climate movement. And to his great credit, in his writing of that, in that piece, I think Bill noticed a, a gap in the climate movement. For writing that piece, he he interviewed a whole bunch of bank campaigners. He interviewed myself. Um, he also interviewed a whole bunch of insurance campaigners, people who are campaigning on insurance companies, because insurance companies play a, a key role in enabling new fossil fuel projects. They can't, new pipelines, coal terminals, LNG terminals can't be built without insurance. So hypothetically, if every insurance company in the world was to say, we're just not going, not going to give any insurance to new fossil fuel projects, there would be no new fossil fuel projects. Um, and then asset managers who are massive investors, BlackRock and Vanguard, BlackRock alone controls $9 trillion worth of investment capital. And there were folks campaigning on, on BlackRock. But none of us were really talking to one another the bank campaigners weren't talking to the insurance campaigners, the insurance campaigners weren't talking to the asset manager campaigners. And um, I think Bill saw that. And so he, along with Jamie Henn, convened a retreat in Vermont in November of 2019. And so there were about 40 or 45 um, various fossil fuel finance campaigners 
climate finance campaigners who met in Vermont. And long story short, Stop the Money Pipeline came out of that retreat. We identified a need for there to be a, a, a coalition of coalitions, an umbrella under which we could all campaign. And that umbrella, that coalition of coalitions was Stop the Money Pipeline. And we left there with a plan for a, a truly mass mobilization on the banks funding the climate crisis. And we were planning on that to be led by the youth, by the youth climate strikers. They were going to call for the day of action. And then much like the September 20th climate strikes of 2019, if folks remember those, we were you know, hoping for hundreds of thousands of people to show up at bank branches, do teach-ins at bank branches, to demonstrate at bank branches, to occupy bank branches, to really hammer the message home loud and clear. And then COVID hit and everything changed and those plans had to be paused. And so we pivoted and we did Earth Day Live, which was a three-day online live stream of climate movement content. And I think four million people tuned in over the three days. And one of those days was, was given over solely to stop the money pipeline content. And that was making the best of a bad situation. And I think we were able to do some good stuff there, but I, I don't think we made our targets feel as much pressure as we would have if there were tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people on the street, as we had initially been dreaming of. Um, but through, through COVID, Stop the Money Pipeline continued to grow. We launched in, we formally launched in January of 2020, and we were 32 organizations when we launched. We're now close to 170 organizations and many of the, the largest climate and environmental groups in the country are represented on our steering committee and helping to move the work forward. That includes 350.org, Sierra Club, Indigenous Environmental Network, Friends of the Earth, Rainforest Action Network, um, and a whole bunch of others. And there was also really powerful Indigenous-led uh, frontline groups are very involved and on the steering committee, like the Ginyu Collective that's leading the fight to stop Line 3, and Mazaska Talks, who um, was so central to starting all of this work and campaigning on, on banks in particular. Um, and then this February, we launched the Defund Line 3 campaign, and Tara Hauska, who I'm sure most folks have heard of, and you haven't you should definitely follow tara online and on her social media for updates from the line three fight launched the defund line three campaign with this op-ed in common dreams and then from there uh, since then in february we know that bank executives have received over 1 million emails from people demanding that they stop funding line three they've received thousands of phone calls we had a single day where they received 10,000 google calendar invites um, reminding them to break up with line three on a specific day. And there's been literally hundreds of actions. Um, in May, May 7th of this year, um, we had a defund line three global day of action. And I'm gonna, I am gonna actually show a short video of uh, the, the, the defund line three global day of action. There were actions in nine countries, four continents, and there were nearly 100 actions in the US alone, um, all across this country. There were actions, and, and this is the, the video from that day of action. Are folks able to hear that okay? Abby, can you confirm that you're able to hear it? So far, I haven't heard any, any sound. Can you hear sound now? No. All over the country. Oh, yes. To demand that banks like Chase, Wells Fargo, and Citibank defund Line 3. Line 3 would cause as much climate damage as 50 coal plants, endanger 800 waterways, and violate treaty rights. It could not be built without the support of major banks. That's why we're taking our message direct to their doors. In Seattle, activists shut down a street and made a human mural outside of J.P. Morgan. In D.C., they took oil barrels, oil spills, and a massive black snake to Wells Fargo's doors. In San Francisco, people painted the streets and shut down bank branches. In New York, 
hundreds took the message to Wall Street directly. In all, activists in nearly 100 cities have taken to the streets, including in the financial centers of Geneva and London, to demand that banks defund Line 3. And we're just getting started. So that was in May, and that campaign very much continues. We are actually calling for a defund line three exposed greenwashing day a week on Friday. Um, despite all of the, actually, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that more in a moment. Um, but now I want to pivot and just in, in five minutes or so here, talk a little bit about what's next. We've spent the last 25 minutes or half an hour talking about everything that's happened. Up until now, and now I want to share a little bit about what's coming next in um, the campaign to hold Wall Street and the financial sector accountable for its role in the climate crisis. I'm going to do a screen share for this, and my apologies if any of you were, like Brian, were on the Deadline Glasgow kickoff call last night. This might be old news to you, but I'll assume that most of you were, were not, and um, I am going to share a little bit about what we're planning over the next couple of like, next three months. So, as I'm sure folks know, uh, the Glasgow climate talks are the most important international climate talks since the Paris Agreement was signed. And it's there, it's now 88 days. This slide is one day old. It is 88 days until the start of the most important international climate talks since Paris. And these were the climate talks when. The Paris Agreement was signed. Every nation in the world said, we're going to come back together in Glasgow in five years, and we're going to ratchet up our climate commitments. And we're also expecting major corporations to release their new climate commitments in the lead up to the Glasgow climate talks. So it's because of this historic moment for climate action that we've uh, stopped the money pipeline is launching the deadline Glasgow campaign and setting the start of the Glasgow climate talks as a deadline by which our demands must be met. Our demands are very simple. They're pretty much stop funding fossil fuels and human rights abuses and climate destruction. But our demands are to pass real policies that ensure that your financial institution is respecting human rights and indigenous sovereignty and its lending practices. Make sure you, are, you have stopped supporting deforestation and that you stop supporting the fossil fuel industry. We also have demands of President Biden. President Biden has huge power to limit Wall Street's ability to harm our climate. And our demands of President Biden are that he and his administration require financial institutions to phase out financing for fossil fuels and deforestation, to end all public money, including subsidies, for corporations engaged in fossil fuels and deforestation, to invest in black, brown and indigenous communities in a way that remedies past harms and promotes a clean and just transition. And finally, demand number four is to hold all firms accountable for respecting tribal nations, treaty and sovereignty rights. So as I just mentioned, our first big action that we're calling for as part of the Deadline Glasgow campaign is a defund line three exposed greenwashing day of action on Friday, August 13th. We just found out, I'm sure folks have been following along, but the police brutality of water protectors and indigenous water protectors in Minnesota has increased dramatically. Um, people have been shot with rubber bullets, have been tear gassed, have been beaten, have been jailed for nearly a week and given crap food and put in solitary. And despite that, we found out recently that Wall Street banks gave $1.5 billion in so-called sustainability loans to Enbridge last month. And these sustainability loans reward Enbridge financially by giving them a better interest rate on their loans for reducing their emissions from their direct operations, from their buildings and their vehicles, but they do absolutely nothing to address the tar sands oil that flows through their pipelines. 
the way I've been framing it and the way that it is, is basically these loans say to Enbridge, so long as you buy a few solar panels and a few electric vehicles, you can keep building tar sands oil pipelines. It's probably the most terrific example of greenwashing I've ever seen. And that's why we're responding quickly to this news and calling for an action to, to call out the greenwashing. There's a bunch of tool uh, resources available, including art kits, and we can send you art. And there's an organizer's guide. We're having a defund line three organizers call on Monday that folks are very welcome to join. I believe Brian and Abby, you should all already have these links and happy to share them with any other folks. Um, there's an action network page. There's already 12 actions confirmed across the country. We're hoping a few more, maybe one in Rhode Island um, would be great. And then, Beyond that, I just want to talk a little bit about what we're doing in the next 88 days to put as much pressure on our targets as possible ahead of the Glasgow Climate Talks, um, as well as uplifting and centering the, the fight to defund Line 3. We're also going to be supporting the Stop Insuring Trans Mountain campaign. Uh, there are now 15 insurance companies that have said they will not insure Trans Mountain. And so we are going to be supporting the campaign that's putting pressure on insurance companies to, to join those 15. And then Formosa, the Formosa Plastics Plant is a uh, environmentally racist project being built in the predominantly black community of St. James, Louisiana. And they have a, a really powerful defund, divest and denounce Formosa campaign that we'll be supporting. We're also going to be offering trainings. We're going to be putting out weekly digital actions, calls, emails, calendar jams, and folks will be sending them out to people via email, but also via text. And these are also actions that groups like Climate Action Rhode Island can, can pick up and copy and paste and send out to your members and your supporters so that we're generating more phone calls, and more emails, and maybe Stop the Money Pipeline puts out a call to our supporters to make phone calls on Tuesday and Climate Action Rhode Island does it on Thursday. That's perfect because that means they're getting more phone calls and more regularly. Uh, we do have a petition on the go. We've got close to 100,000 signatures already. We're aiming for a quarter of a million. And then September 13th to 17th, we're hoping to organize uh, petition delivery actions to at least 500 bank branches, insurance offices, asset managers, and, and hopefully more. Um, we're launching Customers for Climate Justice, which is a new program. Um, but we want to organize, essentially unionize, in a sense, um, customers of banks, of Wall Street banks, so and support them in strategically advocating for climate justice and using their particular leverage as customers. Um, so if any of you are a customer, no shame in it, but uh, I would encourage you to join Customers for Climate Justice and, and use your power as a customer to help us move forward. Um, as I already mentioned, we're going to be pushing President Biden to do more. We're going to have weekly uh, actions, online actions on a Zoom call. People come together for eight to ten. Eight to ten people come together for 30, 45 minutes, take maybe 10 online actions together. We're going to be having like 15 or 20 of those a week, hopefully. And then um, we're going to aim to disrupt a bunch of greenwashing events during New York Climate Week. And then we'll have a bi-weekly campaign newsletter that you will receive if you sign up to Stop the Money Pipeline's mailing list. And um, we're also going to be supporting people in civil disobedience and organizing civil disobedience uh, actions, as we think that that's a really important tactic for social movements to engage in. We are hoping for a day of mass mobilization in the lead up to the Glasgow Climate Talks, either a few days or a week before. And we're working pretty closely with movement partners and other coalitions to, to plan that. And then finally, we're calling for as many actions as possible. Uh, it's rolling actions. And so we launched this action counter last night and we've set a public goal of 500 actions um, at our targets by the start of the Glasgow Climate Talks. So if anyone in Road Action, uh, Road Island organizes an action, I encourage you to jump onto our website and fill out that form, take you 60 seconds, and then we can get that action added to the, the action counter count. And if you share a photo, then we'll have a photo gallery as well. So what we hope is that by November 1st, that action counter says 500. And there are 500 photos from those 500 actions, which we can then use to send to CEOs to show here's how much opposition there is to your, your funding of fossil fuels. Um, so, uh, yeah, that that is it. Um, you know, if, if folks want to take an action right now, 
because we're all here to take action together. Uh, this is Citibank CEO's Jane Fraser's email. So we did this last night. Um, and so I think Jane Fraser, the CEO, came into her work this morning and probably had about 700 emails with one of these um, subject lines, just nothing in the body of the email the subject says it enough. So if you're so moved, feel free to open up your email in another tab and uh, send Jane Fraser an email just saying stop funding the climate crisis or stop funding the fossil fuel industry. Um, those emails really do add up, you know, when they start receiving thousands of them, it becomes much harder for them to ignore. Um, but that's our plan for, for the remainder of Glasgow. And there's a couple other actions here, but I'll not, I'll not go sharing them. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I have. I think we might be over time, but I'll pass it back to Justin. And I'm really uh, appreciative of you all inviting me here and sharing the space. That was great. Thank you. Uh, if you're, uh, I find it super inspiring to, um, you know, just to hear the whole chronology of your um, engagement in activism and the, the, you know, how the successes led to greater ambition. And now, you know, you've become, you've, you've woven this whole fabric of, um, activism across the country even the world with um, these cool collaborations so it is super inspiring um do we want to um do you have time to take a few questions yeah yeah i'm happy to to stay on for for a little bit if people want to just unmute and shout out their questions or if you want to if you're more of a raise your hand type of person you could do that or post a question in the chat <laughs> And let me uh, make one point about uh, recording. What we'll do is um, we'll keep recording for a few of the questions and then we'll turn off recording for anyone who is a little more shy about talking on recorded meetings. So um, you can take your pick if you speak at the beginning or in a, after a couple of questions. We can't Brian. hear you, Brian. <laughs> Brian's got sound challenges tonight. Well, I'll ask, this is kind of a tactical question, but we've, um, Brian has really been just amazing over the past three years or so um, with, I don't know how many dozens of protests at banks. Um, and we've really focused on Chase Banks. And I'm, I'm curious, given the, um, Given the, you know, the fact that multiple banks, uh, Chase may be the biggest kind of overall fossil fuel investor, but with these specific projects, there are multiple banks, including local branches like Bank of America and TD, that are also investors. Like, how do we kind of keep the message tight, but not just, you know, seem like we're just protesting every bank <laughs> there is? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I think for the last four years, we have really focused on Chase because they're the, the biggest and the baddest and the worst by, by a distance. You know, I think Chase has funded the fossil fuel industry by a third more than any other bank in the world. So by like 80 billion more than the second biggest bank. It's not, it's not close. Chase is, Chase is the worst by a very considerable distance. Um, and yet they're all guilty. They're all culpable. So, especially when I say them all, I mean all of the Wall Street big banks, the big six is kind of how people talk of them. That's Chase, Citibank, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Goldman Sachs, and Morgan Stanley. All of them have loaned more than $100 billion to the fossil fuel industry since Paris, which is completely unaligned with the Paris Agreement. Um, so I think we can very much justify broadening our scope and making sure that banks like Citibank, the world's second largest funder of fossil fuels, also knows that they'll be held culpable and that they deserve to be blamed, as well as some of the Canadian-based banks like TD Bank and Royal Bank of Canada. Um, so I think it, it does make sense for us to tell a broader story 
than just chase and to organize actions at banks that not not just chase and we can't lose sight of the fact that chase is the biggest and, and the worst um yeah hopefully that kind of answers that a little bit and yes i did notice that we'd already noticed that morgan stanley is sponsoring climate events yeah so that's part of the greenwashing message i guess which i think you know is to just say one more thing is almost testament to like what we... oh sorry brian were you going to say something yeah <laughs> Um, this new computer. Anyway, um, the uh, I was just going to say that next Friday um, we are planning to hold an event on uh, as part of the national uh, event, and um, we're also the week after. I mean, also this Tuesday, uh, we're going to have a meeting uh, among ourselves to talk about what role we want to play in the um, Glasgow campaign because we've already pretty well decided and talked to the people that they want to do that. So we're going to start from scratch. Like what, what, what will our role be uh, going over the next three months? Um, and anyone interested who's not already on my list or our list, um, you know, you can email me um, at bewilderz7 at gmail.com and um, give you more details um, about what's coming up. Thank you, Brian. Probably the single most important message in this meeting, in my opinion, is if you want to get involved in anything that I just shared about, then then please uh, contact Brian because Brian's organizing on behalf of the Chase campaign and the Deadline Glasgow campaign in, in Rhode Island. So really grateful to, to Brian's leadership and, and organizing as, as part of the broader um, Stop the Money Pipeline coalition. It's a Tuesday is it a Tuesday Zoom call, Brian? And then a where where and when is the yeah, uh, Friday? The Tuesday is a Zoom call, and on the Friday the thirteenth, um, we don't have it all nailed down yet, so um, we can't give you a time and a place yet. But if you contact me or um, or um, Janine or um, some of the other people, uh, Diane, who's in the on the planning committee, a will, um, or me, you know, then I'll give you all the, we'll have the details worked out, you know, by the end of this week. I want to, I want to lift up as well that Brian's had lots of good ideas that some of which that we've used nationally as well. We had a, uh, when Chase uh, released their 2030 climate targets, which are long story short, a horrific example of greenwashing, um, Brian suggested that we should um, deliver greenwashing awards um, to Chase branches. And maybe Brian got that idea from someone else on this call, but Brian shared it with me and Stop the Money Pipeline ran with it. And we ended up having um, people deliver greenwashing awards to about 150 branches um, that week. And, and that idea came from, from Brian and Climate Action Rhode Island. And Brian just emailed me yesterday with an idea about making wanted posters with Jamie Dimon, the Chase CEO's face on them, wanted for climbs against the climate climate, and doing some theater in, in the branches. So I uh, wanted to uplift and, and name that. And Abby um, has also had some great ideas about the Cut the Chase Challenge that we've taken and ran with places beyond Rhode Island as well. I might, um, maybe I'll turn off recording now in case anyone's feeling shy and has questions. Um, 